to this next application. It says, all three of us are students from Reardon High School, and all three of us are interested in girls. Who wrote that? <laughs> well, at least it's direct and to the point. Let's see who these fellows are. Bob Smith, Bob Vicini, and Kirk Roberts. And they call themselves the Bucket Three. How'd you fellas get together? Boy Scout camp. Uh-huh. But there were some Girl Scouts around there, too, with you fellas there, huh? What about your ambitions, you? I mean, besides folk singing? I'm going to uh, pre-med, and I'm going to be a space technician. Uh-huh. What about the other fellow? Well, I'm going in the paint business because my old man's in the paint business. He says I can make a buck or two. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'd believe your old man if I were you. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's have it. The bucket three. Painting in a cave, I'm reenacting the actions of the very first painters. I am depicting visions on the surface of rocks. In this case, the moment that the sun creates a line that is so beautiful that someone in the tribe begins to realize that it's the shape of a real serpent and they see they are following their grand instructor, the sun. Yeah, only a brief moment there that we have the opportunity to capture that sliver of light, which is so beautiful. It's like a, a flying eagle, it's a snake, it has an exquisite center, but only if you're there at that perfect time, of the perfect time of the year, of the perfect time of weather, to see this. So I've marked this going back in time, marking like they did, and hopefully someone will appreciate it. When I was a boy, my father told me that the animal that could see the best and the furthest was the eagle. hundreds and hundreds of years old when this desert landscape used to be a cedar forest. See those little marks? That's like a cut on the... When you're developing a wand and your intention is to make a beautiful object, 
but an object that also has power. Every one of your moves is intended for your best craftsmanship as well as your best magicianship. Magicianship is difficult to define in that you're dealing with an abstract idea that in the biggest terms, the biggest definition of an artist should also be in some way a magician. <laughs> You don't want the serpent when it's up here because then it uh, radiates and it's, uh, you know, you become what you need. Uh, or as a Buddha, the serpent goes up and covers the protection. influenced by going to a magic shop in San Francisco and uh, watching the old magicians trade card tricks during the 50s and uh, these have been with me since I was age 12 uh, and I use them now in some of the all large performances but they're, they're really a, a patina of things and my dad made some of these and we would contribute woodwork and, and artwork uh, to the making of a beautiful piece of work, but it also performed a magic trick. For example, let me show you this. This is a box that I carved, and um, I would go out to the street and I would, you know, pretend that some stranger that was there, excuse me, did you lose this? And they'd say, well, of course not. I've never seen such a strange thing in my life. And then I'd open it up again, and uh, there'd be a card or something granting them their wonder wish to come to my theater that I had uh, built. had to walk into an environment in the middle of Warehouse District in Berkeley where there were no theaters or anything like that, so you had to be adventuresome just to go down there. And nobody greeted you, and you had to wander down an alley, and then inside that room you saw a Wonder Witch. Now, I wasn't even there. I was hidden behind the walls, moving little puppets and things that they saw popping out.
This was the very first time a complete environment had been created, and I created it out of recycled dumpster found materials. All of it. In the mid-1970s, art and science had blended for me. I began to create a series of science experiments, all eye-related, and placed them within elaborately carved shrines. Now then I took pictures of this entire collection and placed them in a large carved magic book that I brought with me to distinguished galleries in San Francisco. Now my un orthodox presentation met with little enthusiasm. I remember sitting there with one of the gallery owners and looking through this rather mm, unusual book and the gallery owner looked up at me and he said, um, um, the only way I'm going to be able to exhibit this is if you're standing in the middle of the gallery explaining all these experiments to the gallery goers. Spirit gave me a wonderful gift. I watched a slow moving glaze of white frost form at the outside of her eye and gradually freeze across the entire surface until it reached the inside edge. Her eye was a lake that at one moment was warm and clear, reflecting the heavens above, and in the next was slowly sealed shut by a thick layer of opaque ice. Her transition into death was complete. All that remained was the sound of the rushing river.
simply the drug of another time, another place, another era. Was it 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago? We are not certain. Welcome to Parapsychology Today. I am your host, Michael Ali, and we thank you for joining us to definitely the gateway to the paranormal. Tonight we are going to be having an incredible journey into the past, live right here in the studio. We have one of the most incredible guests that have ever graced us in. The gentleman goes by the name of Darian Crow, and he is an American shaman. And tonight he will lead us into a heart of a journey, of which we will have together here in this set. Currently tonight, Darian will be sharing with us an incredible book called An American Shaman. And it prefaces something to the effect, in Northern California there is a ridge that has been used since the dawn of time for shamans to enter into a magical reality. A contemporary father is about to find that ridge. And I thank you very much. Let us begin. Uh, many people will probably like to know two things. Um, what is for you to be a shaman? And why that of an American shaman? And tell us please about the discovery of a ridge of a magical reality, a parallel universe. And I'd like to know a little about that and definitely our guest would. Hmm. That's a big question, Michael. Let me start. Uh, by showing you, this is a piece of the ridge. And the ridge was created thousands of years ago. And a group of shamans, a long time ago, crawled along the ridge and said, this is a power spot. And a power spot is a place where ritual and ceremony can happen to elevate people and change their lives. So they built stone walls and they built spots and marked them to be used for ever in a sacred way. And I just happened, because of who I am, to one day be walking along that ridge many thousands of years later yes. and find the same spot. Yes. We must give the shaman both voices, both allies, or he will not be able to walk this path in strength and beauty. So the shaman walked a long way on the path laid out by spirit. He hadn't walked it before. No one had. But his two voices kept him balanced. long way. I think we're strong enough. Do you think we're going to see good things? Yes, and some bad things. We're staying together through it all, no matter where we go. The shaman reached a point in the path where he came across something he'd never seen before. Something so strange and yet similar to his own being. 